Chapter 4 How Siegfried Fought with the Saxons Strange tidings were on their way to Gunther's country, borne by envoys that had been sent to the Burgundians from afar, by unknown warriors, who nevertheless were their enemies. Hearing which, Gunther and his men were greatly vexed. I shall name those warriors for you. They were Ludiger, the proud and mighty sovereign of Saxony, and Ludigast, king of Denmark and they were bringing a host of lordly intruders with them on their campaign. The messengers whom these enemies of Gunther had sent into his country had arrived, and the strangers were asked their business, and at once summoned into the presence of the king, who gave them a friendly greeting. "'You are welcome,' said the good king. "'Now tell us who it was that sent you here.' for I have yet to learn it. But they were much afraid of Gunther's wrath. If you will permit us to tell you the message we bring, sire, we shall not stay silent, but shall name you the lords who have sent us. They are Ludigast and Ludiger, and they intend to invade your country. You have provoked their anger, and, truly, we were told that these lords bear you great hostility. They mean to launch an expedition against worms on the Rhine, and you can take my word for it that they have many knights to support them. In twelve weeks from now their campaign will be launched, so that you must soon let it be seen whether you have any staunch friends to help you to guard your lands and castles. For the men of Ludigast and Ludiger will hack many helmets and shields to pierce here. But if you wish to treat with them, send a message to that effect, and then the numerous forces of your mighty enemies will not draw near to do you such harm as must lead to their destruction of countless gallant knights. Now wait a little until I have considered this affair, answered the good king. And then I will tell you my mind. I shall not keep this momentous news from whatever trusty followers I may have. Rather shall I complain of it to my friends. Mighty Gunther was deeply downcast. He kept the matter privy to his own thoughts, sent for Hagen and others of his men, and summoned Gernot urgently to court. When the noblest that could be found were assembled, he addressed them. Our country is threatened with invasion by strong attacking forces. I call on you to support me. Let us ward it off, sword in hand, answered gallant Gernot. They alone die that are doomed. Leave them for the dead men they are. Such things shall not make me forget my honor. Our enemies are welcome. I would not advise that, said Hagen of Torneck. Ludigast and Ludiger are of arrogant temper, and we cannot muster our forces so soon. But, added the valiant warrior, why did you not tell Siegfried? Word was given to lodge the envoys in the town, and whatever the hatred that was felt for them, it was right of mighty Gunther to have them well cared for, till he should learn from his friends who was going to stand by him. Yet the king was in great anxiety and distress, and Siegfried, gay young knight, seeing Gunther so downcast, asked him to tell him all about it, since he could not know what had happened to him. I am much surprised, he said, that the cheerful demeanor which you have shown us all along is so altered. I cannot tell everyone of the vexations I have to bear locked away in my heart, answered handsome Gunther. One should complain of one's wrongs to proven friends. Siegfried turned pale and then read, I have never denied you anything, he answered the king. 
I shall help you to avert all your troubles. If you are looking for friends, I shall assuredly be one among them, and I trust I shall acquit myself honorably till the end of my days. May God reward you, Lord Siegfried, for I like your words, and if your manly courage never comes to my aid, I shall nevertheless rejoice that you wish me so well. And if I live for any time, you shall be well rewarded. I will tell you why I am downcast. I have been informed by my enemy's envoys that they intend to attack me here, a thing that warriors have never done to us in Burgundy before. Do not let that weigh on you, said Siegfried, but calm your fears. Do as I ask. Let me win honor and advantage for you, while you, on your part, summon your knights to your aid. Even though your powerful enemies had thirty thousand knights to help them, and I only a thousand, I should face them in battle. You can rely on me. I shall always seek to repay you, replied King Gunther. Then muster a thousand of your men for me, since apart from a dozen warriors I have none of my own with me, and I shall defend your lands, for Siegfried will always serve you loyally. Hagen and Utvin, Dunkart and Sinthuld, your beloved stalwarts, must help us, and brave Vulka must ride with them. Indeed, Vulka must bear your standard, since there is none I would give it more willingly. As to the envoys, let them ride home to their lord's countries, and inform their masters that they shall see us very soon, and to such purpose that peace shall be assured for our cities. The king summoned his kinsmen and vassals accordingly. Ludiger's envoys went into the presence of good King Gunther, and were glad to learn that they were soon to go home. And when he offered them rich presents and gave them a safe conduct, they were happy indeed. Now tell my mighty enemies that they would do well to stay at home with their expedition, said Gunther but that if they insist on invading me here, they shall learn what trouble is, unless my friends should fail me. Thereupon, magnificent gifts, of which Gunther had plenty to bestow, were placed before Ludiger's envoys, nor did they dare decline them, but, taking their leave, departed in good spirits. When they arrived in Denmark, and King Ludegast heard the news which they were bringing from the Rhine, he was incensed at his enemy's disdain. The envoys told him that the Burgundians had brave men in great number, and that they themselves had seen standing among them a warrior called Siegfried of the Netherlands. News that Ludigus did not like at all when he learned its import. But, having heard it, the men of Denmark made haste to round up even more of their friends, until Lord Ludigast had enlisted for his campaign twenty thousand knights from among his warlike subjects. King Ludiger of Saxony, likewise, summoned his vassals, till they had upwards of forty thousand with whom they planned to march on Burgundy. For his part, here at home, King Gunther had mustered his kinsmen and his brothers, and Hagen's men, of whom they had great need, though good warriors had later to die for it. They prepared themselves for their march, and when they were ready to cross the Rhine from Worms, valiant Vulka was told to bear the standard, and Hagen to be captain of troops. With them rode Sindulde and Hunuld, 
who were able to earn Gunther's gold, while Hagen's brother, Dankwart, with Orthvin, had good claim to a place of honor on this expedition. Stay at home, my lord king, since your knights are ready to follow me, said Siegfried. Remain here with the ladies, and be of good cheer, for I dare assert I shall guard your lands and honor well. I shall take good care that those who would attack you in worms stay at home, for we mean to ride so close to them in their own country as will turn their arrogance to fear. They rode with their warriors from the Rhine through Hesse toward Saxony, where there was fighting later. They laid waste the countryside with fire and pillage, to the great distress of the two kings. When they came to hear of it, never had Saxons suffered a greater loss from invasion. But now the Burgundians had reached the frontier, and the squires drew away. Who will take charge of our train here? asked mighty Siegfried. Late, let brave Dungfart have charge of the youngsters, they said. Put him and Ulthvin in command of the rear guard, and we shall lose all the fewer to Ludiger's men. And I myself will ride out and reconnoiter the enemy, said valiant Siegfried, until I have made out their positions exactly. Fair Sieglin's son was soon armed. Before leaving, he entrusted the army to Hagen and valiant Gnat, and then rode off alone into Saxony, and many were the helmet straps he cut through on that day. Soon Siegfried saw lying on the great plain the army which to the forces he could rally opposed a seething horde. Forty thousand or more, his spirits rose at the sight of them. On the other side, too, armed to perfection, a warrior had set out towards his enemy to reconnoiter, and him Lord Siegfried saw, as the valiant man saw him, so that each began to watch the other fiercely. I shall tell you who it was on outpost duty, with his bright shield of gold held in readiness. It was King Ludegast guarding his army. Towards him, the noble intruder galloped in fine style, and now Lord Ludegast had marked him down, so that the two of them set their spurs to their chargers' flanks and behemly leveled their spears at each other's shields, with the result that the king was soon in jeopardy. In the train of these thrusts, these princes' mounts bore them past each other at such a pace that they might have been wafted by the wind, whereupon, wheeling with splendid horsemanship, this fierce pair tried their fortunes with their swords. Then Lord Siegfried struck blows that filled the plain with their sound and sent fiery sparks flying from his enemy's helmet as though from huge torches. Each met his match in the other, since Lord Ludegast struck many cruel blows in answer, and their strength of each was brought mightily to bear on the other's shield. Thirty of Ludegast's men were patrolling in that quarter, but before they could come to his aid, Siegfried had won the victory with three great wounds, which he dealt through Ludegast's bright corslet, stout though it was, drawing the blood with his two-edged sword, and damping all his ardor. King Ludegast asked Siegfried to spare him, 
He offered him his lands and told him his name was Ludigast. At this moment, Ludigast's warriors arrived on the field. They had clearly seen what had passed between the two outposts, and, just as Siegfried was about to lead Ludigast away, they charged him thirty strong, and whereupon the hero defended his mighty captive with tremendous blows. Nor was this the last damage the young handsome knight inflicted, for he slew these thirty in a most warlike manner, leaving but one alive to ride off at speed and report what had happened here. With his bloody helmet for proof, when the Danes heard that their lord was a prisoner, they were fearfully afflicted, and when his brother was told of it, he began to rave with boundless anger, for it was a cruel blow to him. Siegfried led valiant Ludegast away by sheer force to Gunther's men, and handed him over to Hagen, who, learning it, that it was the king, was not unduly sorry. The Burgundians were ordered to lace on their pennons. Forward, cried Siegfried, if I remain alive, much shall be achieved here before the day is done, that will sadden many a fine lady in Saxony. Keep me well in sight, you warriors from the Rhine for I can lead you straight into Ludiger's army, and there you will see such a hacking of helmets by stout fighting men. Before we turn back, they will know what trouble means. Gernot and his men raced to their chargers. Lord Vulka, the bully minstrel, seized the standard, and rode at the head of the column, who, for their part, were all splendidly equipped for battle. Though apart from Siegfried's twelve, they brought a mere thousand to the field. Clouds of dust rose up over the ways, and many fine shields gleamed among them as they rode across country. The Saxons, too, had come with their divisions, bearing keen swords, which I learned since, bit deep when wielded by those warriors. They meant to defend both their castle and their lands from these intruders. The captains of the two kings led their forces on, and Siegfried too had arrived with those whom he had brought from the Netherlands. Many a hand was reddened in the blood of battle that day. Sindold, Hunold, and Gannat slew many warriors in combat, before these had readily grasped how daring their slayers were, so that afterwards many ladies had to weep for them. Vulka, Hagen, and Ulthvin who knew no fear in the fight, dimmed the brightness of numberless helmets with streams of blood in the fray, and Dungfat performed marvels. And now the men of Denmark tried their hands. You could hear the clang of countless shields under the impact of their charge, and of the sharp swords too, that were swung there in plenty, while the valiant Saxons also wrought much havoc. When the Burgundians thrust into the battle, they hacked wound on gaping wound, and blood was seen flowing over saddles. So boldly did those knights woo honor, and win their stalwarts from the Netherlands pressed after their lord, into the closed ranks of the enemy. Their keen swords rang loud and clear as they wielded them. They went in 
with Siegfried, like the splendid young fighting men they were. Not one of the Rhinelanders was seen to keep up with Siegfried. But as his blows fell, you could pick out the rivers of blood running down from his enemy's helmets, till at last he came upon Ludiger at the head of his companions. Siegfried had cut his way through the enemy there and back for the third time, and now Hagen had come to help him to have his fill of fighting, so that many excellent knights had to die that day from the pair of them. Finding Siegfried before him, and seeing him swing his good sword, Bulmung, so high, and slay so many of his men, mighty Lord Ludger was seized with fierce anger. There was a grand melee, and a loud ringing of swords as their retinues closed with each other. Then the two warriors made harsh trial of their prowess, till the Saxons began to give ground. Bitter was the strife between them. The lord of the Saxons had been informed, to his great wrath, that his brother had been taken prisoner. But he was unaware that Siegfried was his captor, since the deed was ascribed to Gernot though later he did learn the truth of it. Ludiger dealt such powerful blows that Siegfried's horse stumbled under him. But when the beast had recovered itself, Siegfried raged terribly in the fight. In what was aided by Hagen, Gnat, Dunkvot, and Vulka, so that many men lay slain there, Sindult Hunult and Sir Atvin too laid low many foemen. These princes were locked in battle. You could see javelins beyond number hurled by warriors' hands, flying over helmets and piercing bright shields, with buckler after buckler all stained with blood. Many knights dismounted in the thick of it. Siegfried and Ludiger assailed each other on foot amid flying spears and keen-edged javelins. Siegfried of the Netherlands was bent on wresting victory from the brave Saxons, of whom many were now wounded, and the weight of his blows sent the bolts and braces flying from their shields. And oh, the bright mail corslets that Dunkford burst asunder. Then, suddenly, Lord Ludiger descried a crown painted on Siegfried's shield over the grip, and he knew at once the mighty man was there. Stop fighting, all my men, the warrior shouted to his friends. I have just recognized mighty Siegfried, son of Sigmund. The devil accursed has sent him here to Saxony. He ordered them to lower their standards and sue for peace. Peace was later granted him. Though overwhelmed as he had been by fearless Siegfried, he had to be a prisoner in Gunther's land. By common accord they ceased their fighting, and the Saxons laid aside their helmets and broad shields, which, one like the other, were pierced through and through and blood-stained from blows dealt by the Burgundians, who now made captive whomever they pleased since theirs was the power to do so. Warlike Gnat and Hagen had the wounded placed on litas, and they took back to the Rhine as prisoners five hundred fighting men. 
The Danes rode back defeated to Denmark. Nor to their shame had the Saxons fought so marvellously as to earn themselves any glory. The fallen were deeply mourned by their kinsmen. Then the Burgundians ordered their armor to be transported to the Rhine. In company with his stalwarts, gallant Siegfried had done what he had set out to do, and he had so distinguished himself that all Gunther's men could not but admit it. Lord Gernot sent messengers to Worms to inform his friends at home of his and his men's successes, and how honorably these bold men had acquitted themselves. The pages spurred hard and made report, and those who had been downcast were overjoyed at the glad news that had reached them, while noble ladies were heard eagerly inquiring how the king's vassals had fared. One of the messengers was summoned into Kriemhild's presence, and this was done in great secrecy. She dared not do it openly, since among those who had fought was the darling of her heart. When she saw the messenger entering her chamber, lovely Kriemhild said very kindly, Tell me the good news, and I will reward you with gold, and if you tell me truly, I shall always be your friend. How did my brother Gernot and others of my relations come off in the fighting? Have we perhaps lost many dead? Or, tell me, who acquitted himself best there? There were no cowards on our side anywhere, the page was quick to answer. But, my noble princess, since you have asked me, no man rode so well in battle as our noble guest, brave Siegfried of the Netherlands, who worked miracles there. Whatever all those warriors, Dungfurt, Hagen, and the other royal vassals, did during the fighting, and whoever they strove to win honor, they achieved nothing compared with Siegfried, King Sigmund's son. They killed a host of warriors while the battle raged, but none could tell you all the marvels which Siegfried performed whenever he entered the fray. Such sorrow did he bring to ladies by slaying their kinsmen. The lovers of many ladies fell there too, never to rise again. His blows rang on their helmets so mightily that their blood came streaming from their wounds. He was all the qualities that go make a brave good knight. But whatever the exploits of Ortvin of Metz, all he could reach with his sword fell wounded, or for the most part dead. Your brother inflicted the greatest anguish possible in battle. One must concede the truth to these rare warriors. The Burgundians bore themselves so manfully that their honor is free of all tarnish. They emptied saddle after saddle with blows from their shining swords that echoed loudly over the plain. Indeed, the Rhenish warriors rode to such purpose that it would have been better had their enemies refrained. When the armies met with all their forces, the brave knights of Tronic inflicted fearful losses, and valiant Hagen himself dispatched a great number, of which there would be much to tell on arriving back here in Burgundy. While Gernot's men, St. Huld and Hunold, and fearless Rumuld, too, performed such feats that Ludiger will always rue having sent messengers to the Rhine to declare war on your kinsmen from beginning to end of the battle. Siegfried did the greatest deeds that we have witnessed anywhere, and with what relish. The splendid man is bringing back to Gunther's lands captives of great rank, subdued by his strength and courage. 
for whom King Ludegast and his brother Ludiger of Saxony must bear the loss. And now listen to the news I bring, most noble princess. Siegfried captured them both. Thanks to his prowess, never were so many prisoners brought back to this country as are coming rhinewards now. No news could have been more welcome to Krimhild. Believe me, my lady, the page continued, more than five hundred able-bodied men are being brought to Burgundy, and eighty blood-stained liters of men who are sorely wounded, most of them hewn by brave Siegfried. Those who in their pride sent their challenge to the Rhineland are now perforce Gunther's prisoners, and are being led here with rejoicing. A blush suffused Krimhild's fair cheek when she learned the news. Her lovely face blushed red as a rose on hearing that handsome young Siegfried had happily emerged from great peril. She was glad for her relatives, as indeed she should have been. You have brought me good news, and for your pains you shall have some fine clothes, and ten marks of gold I shall have fetched for you. Such gifts encourage one to sell such news to great ladies. The messenger received his reward of gold and clothes, whereupon the windows were thronged with pretty girls who kept looking over the road along which a host of proud warriors was riding back to Burgundy. And there came the hale and hearty, together with the wounded. They could hear their friends welcome without shame. The king rode out cheerfully to meet his guests, for his great sorrows had yielded to joy. He received his own men honorably, and the strangers too, since to have done otherwise than to thank those kindly who had come to his aid, and won a glorious victor, would have ill beseemed a mighty king. Gunther asked for news of his friends, and inquired who had been killed on this campaign, and he was told that he had lost no more than sixty. They had to be resigned to their loss, as still happens when heroes are slain. Those who were unwounded brought back to Burgundy many a shield and helmet battered and cut to pieces. The army dismounted before the royal palace, where glad sounds of welcome met the ear. The king had the warriors quartered in the town, his guests well cared for, and the wounded tended and given every comfort while his treatment of his enemies bore witness to his quality. "'You are welcome,' he said to Ludigast. "'Owing to you I have suffered great harm. But, if I am lucky, this will soon be made good to me. God reward my friends. They have done well by me.' "'You may indeed thank them,' replied Ludigar. "'No king ever won more prisoners of such rank.' If you will treat us well while we are in your custody, and act mercifully towards your enemies, we shall pay you handsomely. I will leave you your personal freedom, the two of you provided that my enemies remain here with me, answered Gutha, and I require sureties that they will not quit my territories without leave. Ludiger gave his hand on it. They were then led to their rest and made comfortable. The wounded were kindly put to bed, and for those who remained whole, meal and good wine were poured out. These warriors were as happy as could be. Their battered shields were taken away to store, and orders were given for the blood-stained saddles, of which there were so many, to be hidden away lest the ladies be moved to tears and still many good knights were arriving, weary from campaigning. The land was full of both friend and foe. The king entertained his guests with unheard-of magnanimity, commanding that the sorely wounded be tended 
with great solicitude. Thus the pride and swagger of the invaders had been brought very low. Physicians were offered rich rewards of unweighed silver, and of bright gold too, if they could heal the combatants now that the stress of war was past. In addition of which, the king gave lavishly to his allies there. Those of them who wished to set out on their journey home again were asked to stay, as is the custom with friends. And now he took counsel how he might reward his vassals who had fulfilled his wishes so triumphantly. Let them ride away now, advised Lord Gunnott, but invite them to return in six weeks' time for a festivity, when many who are now badly wounded will have recovered. Whereupon Siegfried of the Netherlands asked the king leave to depart. But on being acquainted with his wish, King Gunther was admirably begged him to stay, a thing Siegfried would not have done but for Gunther's sister, and something. And although he had well deserved the king's friendship, like that of Gunther's kinsmen who had witnessed his feats in battle, he was too exalted to accept a reward. Thus Siegfried decided to remain there for the sake of the lovely young woman whom he hoped to be able to meet. And indeed he did so much later, for he came to know her as well as he had wished, and rode back happily to Sigmund's land. By royal command, knightly sports were held continuously, and many young knights followed them with zest. Meanwhile, on the river bank, below Worms, the king had seats set up for those who had been invited to Burgundy. Towards the time when the guests were expected, it came to the ears of lovely Krimhild that her brother wished to give a feast in honor of his esteemed allies, and accordingly fair ladies gave assiduous attention to the dresses and wimples they would wear. When queenly Ute heard of the proud knights who had been invited, she had some magnificent fabrics taken from the chest, and clothes got ready for love of her dear children. And with these many ladies, maidens, and young warriors of Burgundy were adorned, but she had many fine robes made up for the strangers as well. <laughs>